I'm like, this can't be. Is Roy ignorance this big of an epidemic? Japanese government officials say they have instructed Tokyo Electric Power Company to install multiple power sources at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. A recent power blackout there shut down the cooling systems for spent nuclear fuel pools for more than a day. We've told TEPCO to supply multiple power sources for the cooling systems and implement other efforts as quickly as possible to restore public confidence in the safety of the plant. However, expectations of a breakthrough on the most pressing issues appear low. TEPCO's handling of the power failure has greatly damaged public trust. Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga said the government also told the firm to improve its risk management as the utility failed to promptly report the latest problems to the authorities. But it's probably best if we just ignore what they're about to say. The plant suffered a power failure on Monday night. It took about 29 hours to restore power to all the affected cooling systems, which service four spent fuel pools. So all I'm saying is if anybody thinks that they're not going to screw you, well, good for you. Crews in northeastern Japan have passed something of a milestone as they work to clean up the mess made by the March 2011 disaster. Workers in the three hardest hit prefectures have disposed of just over half the debris generated by the earthquake and tsunami. Government estimates two years ago suggested 16.3 million tons of debris were scattered across Iwate, Miyagi and Fukushima prefectures. That didn't include sediment that washed ashore. Environment Minister officials say crews disposed of about 8.4 million tons of waste by the end of February. They've set the end of March 2014 as the deadline to finish the job. But they believe it will be difficult to complete the disposal of Shajo in Fukushima, the location of Japan's damaged nuclear plant. Progress is slower there because some debris is contaminated by radiation released when reactors at the facility melted down. Not all areas in Fukushima require decontamination. In many districts where people live, the radiation level is roughly the same as in other parts of Japan. Still, local officials have started a long-term monitoring program for the two million residents of Fukushima. They're working to assess the health risks from the radiation emitted at the time of the Fukushima Daiichi accident. They say they have not found cases of exposure that could cause health problems so far, but many feel they have to remain on guard. NHK World's Mitsuko Nishikawa has more. Rudy Komashiko and her 18-year-old daughter, Runa, have lived in Koriyama, Fukushima, all their lives. They're constantly worried about the radiation released from Fukushima Daiichi. I'm concerned about our internal exposure. They're concerned because radioactive cesium has a half-life of 30 years. Mashiko took her daughter to the hospital to find out if she'd been exposed. We did not detect cesium in your body. We don't think there's any accumulation in your system. Many people in Fukushima have been getting checked. Once humans ingest cesium, either by breathing, drinking, or eating, it can emit radiation inside them and could cause cancer. More than 40,000 people had the examination at this hospital alone. Most were cleared, but five people tested positive. Their cesium levels were at or below the safety standard set by the Japanese government. The staff questioned the patients and found they had eaten wild plants, such as mushrooms and berries, which aren't screened. The research team concluded that's where the cesium came from. One expert says, according to their research, the only risk of internal radiation exposure is from eating unscreened food. As long as people here in Fukushima are buying uh, food from market or supermarket, for instance, uh, they do not need to worry so much about internal contamination. Professor Hayano says screening for radiation in food and internal radiation checks should continue for years. After the Chernobyl accident, also the percentage of internal contamination decreased. Uh, but then it went up again after 5-10 years. And we have to make sure that it doesn't happen here in Fukushima.
Mashiko now says she believes the risk of exposure is low. Still, she's taking precautions. She reads about what she buys, where it's from, and how it's tested. It's a heavy psychological burden because we always have to be conscious when buying and eating food. And this may last for decades. I feel insecure. Mashiko wonders how long she and her daughter will have to stay on guard. Many people in Fukushima are wrestling with the same dilemma and likely will for years to come. First, the U.S. has been adding a fluoride to its public water supply for decades, and of course, to prevent tooth decay. Well, now researchers from Japan are suggesting that we add lithium. So why is that? Well, they're actually not suggesting it, but they're certainly looking into it. Lithium is a medication that in prescription doses treats mood disorders in people with bipolar disorder or manic depressive illness. And what these researchers found in Japan is that it's, uh, lithium is present in trace amounts in the normal water supply in some communities. And in those communities, they have a lower suicide rate. And so they're really investigating whether trace amounts of lithium can just change the mood in a community enough to really, in a, in a positive way, without having the bad effects of lithium, to really affect the mood and decrease the suicide rate. Very interesting hmm. concept. You know, it's the same reason why we put um, iodine and salt, fluoride and water. Um, there's, there's many different examples of when we put trace amounts of chemicals in the normal supply of food or water to help people's health. Right. Although not, this is the first where they're actually affecting people's moods and, you know, the brain. So that... Uh, I'm sure it puts up a lot of red flags for people. So all I'm saying is if anybody thinks that they're not going to screw you, well, good for you. 2.46 in the afternoon. Shock waves from the earthquake reach the plant. The reactors active at the time automatically go into shutdown. Then the plant loses power. Generators kick in to keep cooling the reactors. 50 minutes later, tsunami waves engulf the reactor buildings and flood the generators. The plant suffers a station blackout, cutting out power to all cooling systems. Around 6.50 p.m., Fuel rods inside Reactor 1 overheat and start melting down. The overheated nuclear fuel interacts with water to produce hydrogen gas. The next day, 3.36 p.m., a hydrogen explosion partially destroys the reactor building. Workers start pumping in seawater to try to cool things down. But it's not enough. They're unable to prevent two more hydrogen explosions over the next three days. Engineers reveal later that something far more serious was underway, a triple meltdown. The situation escalates into a level 7 nuclear accident, the maximum on the international nuclear and radiological event scale. The TEPCO general manager told NHK World the incident defied all expectations difficult to actually imagine that situation, especially uh, yeah, just a station blackout. Uh, we uh, have been doing the, being trained and using the simulator or something else. So it's not so a big surprise, but uh, uh, station blackout continued for an extended time period, very long. And uh, also it happened not only at the one plant, but uh, multi plants. Two years later, engineers are still struggling to contain radioactive material and understand what's going on inside. Workers have covered Reactor 1 with a protective tarp, and they're building hard shells around Reactors 3 and 4. They've installed cooling systems to try to keep nuclear fuel at temperatures that are safe. TEPCO officials say they've managed to keep emissions of radioactive particles under control. But inside, radiation levels are so high, it would take only about an hour for a person to be exposed to a fatal dose. 
so workers will be challenged in the efforts to decommission the reactors. The process could take between 30 and 40 years. Workers still have to figure out what to do with thousands of spent fuel rods in the reactor buildings. Workers need to keep them at a stable temperature to prevent a meltdown. Engineers are building the necessary infrastructure to remove the rods and facilities in which to store them. TEPCO officials also need to deal with water that is highly contaminated. Workers pump more than 100 cubic meters of water through each of three reactors to prevent them from meltdown every day. The officials say up to 400 tons of underground water seeps in on a daily basis. Engineers are racing to build additional tanks, but they're running out of space. More than 600 square kilometers of land around the plant is still an evacuation zone. And over 150,000 residents cannot go back home. We bring new friends to play. Hi. Show how much you care. I wrote this just for you. We make you smile, GE. We bring good things to live in. We bring good things to live in. We bring good things to life. We let you live it again. We bring a song to your night. We help you to create. We keep you looking right. We bring you closer. Closer and closer to the ones you love.